So I've, I've been thinking of a way to get, you know, to get fine uh, segue into this. Um, I thought maybe first asking you about kind of the, the background of this performance and what led you to, to make it, uh, to, to kind of express yourself and, and dramatize it in this performance in that way, uh, kind of a background. But maybe I first want to ask, just to be sure, um, whether any of you has a kind of a first response to this. To, to we all listened very closely. I saw all everyone looking very intensely at the performance. So um, both uh, the gig workers they're joining us uh, in uh, in in the uh, in the audience. Um, and we'll have microphones, by the way, right? Are there people with microphones? Yes, at least one person. Um, but maybe start here in, on, on the panel. Um, any first thoughts? Any any like need to respond or a a return a question about about what you just heard? Um, and uh, so yes, or and otherwise I'll, I'll turn it to. Uh, yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting, and I think it's exactly what we want to discuss today. That there are work arrangements in the uh, digital economy in the tech in the tech sector that are uh, basically designed to, um, to provide flexibility, but actually not a two-way flexibility, but the flexibility in one side, and that is definitely not with the worker. So that, I mean, that's what I'm taking away from the, from the performance, and I'm, I'm eager to learn uh, what, what others might respond to that and what their experiences are, and to learn what other uh, tech companies, what kind of work arrangements they actually uh, go for. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it was very interesting the way you described your life. It's like you're running around in circles and there's no future, no way out of it. So it's really important for us to deal with the questions you um, gave us and find ways that um, people uh, con of that work contribute, ways to find uh, that work contributed to um, your well-being instead of uh, downsizing it. Any other first responses or, or anything you want to add to it or, or like does it, for instance, for you guys, I was wondering, do, to what extent does her performance and the stuff she talks about like resonate with you in your uh, experience as a gig worker? Because everybody, as we've already discussed, everybody's kind of positioning in that, in that system, in the world is, is, is quite different. So I can also imagine that it might not resonate, for instance, right? So, so what is your first thought? <coughs> what are your first thoughts? Uh, well, a lot of things doesn't... Maybe close. Oh, sorry. Um, so obviously I work for Helpling, so I don't cycle as much as you do. So because I normally have two clients on a day, daily basis, so that's less of a cycle. And but I do like when I heard you, I thought, yeah, that's what you said too: living in your own world and not having contact with other colleagues and just living. So that's something that triggered me. That's my question also, but that will be <laughs> happening later. Yeah. Yeah. Also wants to say it it uh, certainly also resonated with me a lot because uh, as a sound engineer I also struggle to find clients myself etc as a freelancer so um, so I also went to Uber and I also have two other like side gigs where it's a zero hour contract so really this waiting for for job opportunities and like getting the SMS every day or not every day, uh, accept the job or not accept the job, or maybe should I go Ubering today to make some money and sustain a living? That's really uh, what I experience as well. Yeah, I was just gonna say what I don't have with Helpling is that you don't have enough job opportunities. It's, it's more than, uh, it's like there's so much, that's what my experience is anyway, that there were, loads of just you know do you want this offer do you want this customer client um so i didn't have that problem not having enough work but that's just me do you want to respond to any of this or also maybe i provide a bit of background or something yeah i think the the bit of background has also a lot to do i mean this whole conference which i i was part of yesterday as well listening in on the talks on on, on the papers being presented seems to be like a culmination of the past 10 years of my life because again, I haven't just been working for Deliveroo for almost a year now. I also did work for, through Upwork at a certain point in the country that I come from, Romania. So I was like a contractor through another platform for 10 years. Then I started doing gig work because that's the easily accessible one. And that's what I'm trying to say. This is, I, I got this job because I needed to make a living and because I made a choice in my career 
to switch from one country to another uh, and to, um, to pursue indeed my dreams and my aspirations. But I, I have the feeling that I'm in the meantime being exploited by the companies that are trying to also make a living because it's... It, they, in, the, exploited in what way, right? Because it's, it's a heavy word. Yeah, so good exploit, maybe, exploitation and bad exploitation. Oh, yeah, that was Explo yesterday. <laughs> that was yesterday, exactly. But never mind the, the good and the bad exploitation, but, but what, what does that mean for you in your life, to, to be exploited? Well, it's easy yeah. to be uh, dictated how you can work and when you can work and when your contract can end and um, everything is so short-term that you can't really plan your life around it. Like, I, I don't mind investing additional time and energy into getting into becoming an, I couldn't call myself an artistic entrepreneur, but into becoming an artist. But the point is that uh, in the meantime, I do need to make a living because also the artist world has its own problems. So I choose to give my trust and my um, dignity, somebody mentioned a moment ago, by doing these jobs, which are not necessarily glamorized jobs. Like the food delivery courier, cleaner, they're not that. In fact, well, you, once you start doing them, you realize there's almost nothing glamorous in them. But um, I, I do this and I offer my, my energy and my, my uh, physical power and my time to the betterment of these companies while I see that conditions from the company side are being imposed on me more and more. It's something that I can't really contribute to, I, can't, I don't have any control over. So, so there's lack of control and, and then combined with the increasing kind of control also through the app, through the algorithm perhaps. Yes. Uh, um, that, that, that determines, in a way, That your, determines your work me practices? not being able to pay my rent at the end of the month uh -huh. because I don't know what's going to happen next. And also that need to work, and then the, combined with the control, that really leads me back uh, to, to you, and also maybe to you, about, because what you always emphasize, right, also in it's your presentation, is flexibility, right? So, so flex, my question then um, would be, like, flexibility to what extent? What kind of flexibility is this? And for who is that flexibility? Is it especially flexibility on the demand side or the supply side, right, for the company or for the worker? Uh, or is it both, right? Let's always try to see that ambivalence. It's never either or. But, you know, if you hear this, uh, um, and that's, all, of course, one uh, perspective, but if you hear this, um, what is left of that, uh, you know, the, the, the big goal of flexibility and, and just the stuff that Uber is also proud of, uh, uh, giving people a flexible job uh, or at least a, a mode of income generation? So, yeah, that brings me back again to this two-way flexibility that indeed is uh, the most, uh, the, 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 what, what uh, people cherish uh, using the Uber app is really, and that's what you said, you cannot uh, plan your life around your work and with us, it's actually the other way around. You can plan your work around your life. Because uh, there has been some very interesting research in the US where people were asked, like, what would happen if tomorrow you have a $400 bill unexpectedly, your washing machine is breaking or something. And then they say, yeah, then actually I would not be able to pay it. And having the ability to basically access a digital intermediary, an app, whatever you call it, uh, to access work instantly and to manage it real time. I'm working today, I'm working two hours tomorrow. I, I have a friend's birthday, I'm not going, I'm not going to switch on the app. So that, that is the flexibility that we want to stand for. And again, like if, if flexibility is only seen, uh, perceived from, from the employer side or from, from the platform side, then that's not the way we want to go to. And that's where we talk about precarious work, definitely. It's what we also see, and that's what I tried uh, in, in my presentation, is also that digital intermediaries can actually help bridging those periods where actually in between jobs. You mentioned uh, sound engineering zero hour contracts. It's great to have a contract, but if it says it doesn't uh, give you any minimum hours and uh, kind of um, any expectancy of, of income, I think that I'm not saying that it's just us, but like tools like ours can actually help bridge those uh, phases where you, you uh, unexpectedly do not end up uh, having any, any income. So but it's, but it's yeah. still the case of not like predictability. You're saying it's still a side job. But in fact, many people use it as a main job, and they don't have stability that's, in that. That's because, that's interesting, because basically, exactly, we're not controlling uh, for how long someone is logging on. We're not controlling how many people are online at the same time. And that's why people use it for many different reasons. Um, some people, I'm from Brussels, so I can say that, like, uh, we have a lot of, um, for example, Brussels airport shuttles, yeah? Um, that offer their services uh, through their website and uh, also with business cards. So 
any time they don't have a client, they use the Uber app, for example, specifically as a uh, marketing tool to actually access a client that they would not have met otherwise. This sounds a little bit like the dating uh, comparison. So this is just one example of, of, of a professional driver using the Uber app as another marketing tool. Then we have people who actually have part-time jobs, maybe one of those that um, are underemployed, meaning they have a part-time job but they wish to work more. But it's actually difficult because with that one part-time job, which is actually uh, regularly on a regular basis, he might not find another part-time job, which might not be desirable, that exactly fits in that schedule. And that's why we think that providing flexibility can actually uh, mitigate those uncertainty risks by saying, I can access the work when I want. Obviously, this is a bigger debate because then there's also many factors. It's not you're turning on the app and you're earning money. It's also about uh, knowing your city, but um, maybe later to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I think the flexibility is really a, a big part because if you're trying to do this full time, or you may have to do this full time because there are no other opportunities at the moment, then I think flexibility is completely out of the picture because um, to actually be able to, to earn enough money to live for example, as an Uber rider, you would have to ride on a Friday and Saturday. There is no way you can do any social activities with your friends because that's the part where you uh, earn the most money. Most people order food on the weekends at night. Also, um, also even if you're doing it as a part-time, there is not 100% flexibility from the worker side because we would still have to work during most of the time, uh, dinner hours. Like I've experienced, for example, in the beginning that I uh, uh, went online during lunch and in Uber we have the guaranteed earnings, right? Where you would have uh, to accept at least one offer um, per hour and you have to have a 90% acceptance rate. Um, otherwise, you don't get the, uh, the guaranteed earnings. I was online during lunch, no offers meaning no money. And I'm working for like one and a half, two hours and I'm making zero money, you know? And, and so there's the flexibility completely out of the picture, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the, the understanding that you can just like hop on your bike and deliver something, for example, as, as a food career, but not really. Of course, you have to mentally prepare yourself that you're gonna start your shift, you're gonna bike for 40, like kilometers from now on, you, you have lot, to, right? yes, I bike a lot, that's correct. You have to mentally prepare yourself that you're gonna be waiting. It's not, it's not so easy as to say, I turn this on now and whenever it happens, I pick up an order and I do it. No, it's, I mean, you're still human. You still have to react to so many other factors. It's not so easy to bend yourself. Yeah, I was wondering, cause Flexibility from one side is no flexibility, yeah, that's insecurity. Um, I was wondering what do you need from uh, all the companies to combine your flexibility with flexibility or of the platform? What, what do you want? What do you need? Um, I, I'm not sure actually if I understand the question perfectly. Well, you tell us that you, um, uh, working for a company like Uber, you have to be uh, ready to, 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 to go for another, and you don't know if you really get the order. So you have to be, uh, there's no flexibility, you told us, because you have to be uh, waiting all the time uh, to hear whether you can work or not. And if you don't work, uh, you get sort of punished by not being called again. So I was wondering, what do you expect from your employer, from the companies you work for? <laughs> what do you want that they uh, d um, give you to um, create a better balance between your interests and the interests of the company and the interests of the people who ordered the food? Well, I mean, I mean, it is flexible in terms of when I can work because I can decide if I want to work on Thursday or Friday. But if I go online during lunch hours and there's no 
offers, then I'm not working and I'm not, I'm not making any money. So, so what um, about maybe a guaranteed payment? Then? Exactly. So that would be that would be something um, that. Uh, well, in the case yeah. of in the case yeah, of Deliveroo, like, this still exists because, like I said, I'm on a I'm on a contract. So when I log in, for how long I log in, I'm being paid because I'm available. I'm being paid for my availability, not necessarily for the, the fact readiness. that I, I bike from one point to another. And that's, and that's not, the case, that's not the case with Uber, that's no. That's not the case with Uber, exactly. Or maybe a higher payment. That the also a higher the, payment, uh, yes. uh, the, 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 the left hours, how do you call it? The, the orders where you are available, but there's no work, are compensated with money. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I was going to say, can you not, like, if you know when you're able to work, can you not then um, already say when you're able to work so that they can quickly get to you? Does it not work like that? So if you know that you can work on Thursday That's and Friday... Thing. No, because it comes in and then you hear it. I don't know how it works. So you well, that's it, flexibility, right? It, it yeah, works that I, I decide to work shift. on Thursday and then I open the app and I go online okay, and then I get requests. Okay. Okay. And not. if, yeah, or not. Um, so I can't say to Uber, hey, listen, I'm going to work on Thursday. Uh, how many people are going to work on Thursday? So this is something that I was wondering also. Um, how many people are online, you know, and who gets the requests? Why do people get requests? Why do I sometimes not get a request? Uh, uh, what are the reasons for that? Because with this system, I can assume that sometimes people, there, there might be, I mean, I have no idea, maybe 20 careers, maybe 200 careers for Uber Eats out there. Um, what, what does that mean for me as a, as a driver? Do I get less requests, the more drivers there are out. Okay, so let's unpack a lot of questions. Um, first of all, the thing is we also, we, we don't know how many riders, uh, how many couriers will be online with you. That, that we don't know. So w what we do is we are a matchmaker in the, in the rides business between the driver and the rider. And in the couriers business, it's courier restaurants and the eater, let's put it that way. Um, so, and that is available 24 hours. What we cannot, we, we also don't know whether you will work, but we also don't know whether someone will order lunch. So yes. that's why we, we don't know these things. What we can do is, and that's what we're trying to do, and again, that comes back to, um, there's a business case. I mean, we want you to use our app and not use someone else. Uh, or, s or actually, we're not only in competition there. I mean, you could also find uh, another part-time job that gives you flexibility, maybe, that is not even in the online business. Yeah? So we're actually in competition with any other opportunity that you might have. Yeah? Um, so that, that's to that. Um, so we're basically matching you with, with, with someone that wants something. Yeah? Um, the second question is, how are the uh, orders assigned? Or maybe first of all, what we can do is we can provide you with the information where you are, uh, where you have a higher um, um, probability of getting uh, requests in the, dry, in the in the rights business, for example. Um, that what um, those people that use the app uh, or have ever seen uh, the the drivers app for, of Uber, there you can actually see the hot zones where there's high demand. So that means that uh, drivers are informed. Actually, if you go to that side of the city the probability that you will earn more is, is higher. So this is definitely information that we need to work on and that we need to uh, make more sophisticated so that you have all the information that you need in order to make a decision um, whether you want to work or not. Yeah. Um, how are the orders assigned? So uh, the big word A, algorithm, um, um, there's different factors. Um, the most important one is that um, the person that is that has the closest ETA, is the is expected time of arrival, will be assigned the, um, the order. And if you happen to be here now and someone orders from a restaurant, uh, 
to be honest, I don't, I'm not, I don't know Amsterdam too well, but let's say the city center, there might be someone else that is closer that might get then the order. So that's how it is assigned. Actually, it's really the, the, the estimated time of arrival. Not ratings, not uh, a canceled, uh, no. a cancellation, or, or the, uh, the, the number of uh, gigs you have accepted over the last month? The ratings play a role in, in maintaining the, the, the safety uh, and the professional service. And they are basically uh, put together by, um, so the courier is rating the restaurant, the restaurant is rating the courier, the eaters rating the courier, and is re eater, uh, the eaters also rating the restaurant, and then also but the dish. I have a question. Don't you also have like internal ratings as how far is your rider, how far is he delivering, how, how well, far how, distance? how reliable, yes, exactly. So how, I mean, let's say, does he have a profile within your company based on which you can decide he gets an order or not? No. Because we do. That's the rating. That's we the do, but that's not transparent to us. So basically, you get like some sort of, you don't get ratings between customers and. and the information and that so we on. have is basically if that person, what kind of vehicle he is driving. So, so does that have a, does that have an impact actually on the accepted uh, the accepted time of arrival? Because if someone has a scooter, who is fast. further away than I am to the restaurant, might be at that restaurant even quicker because he's on a scooter. Does he get the offer or do I get the offer, although I'm closer? Mm -hmm. That takes into consideration also like whether actually a scooter is always faster as a bike. Um, but definitely if, if, if we, especially in Brussels, um, congestion, um, um, what we basically take into consideration is that um, if this order is 15 kilometers, then surely this will be assigned to someone who's motorized. Because 15 kilometers, I mean, in the end, the courier is ending up rushing to the restaurant, rushing to the uh, eater. The eater says, why are you so late? Why are you sweaty? Why, why is my food it, cold? Why would it even be allowed to be 15 kilometers? That's this is just insane. hypothetical now. But we do have uh, areas uh, in Brussels, for example, uh, when you go out to Waterloo, uh, then um, it's actually a longer distance. And also the ways to go there are actually difficult. Not all cities are very biker friendly. Bike friendly, sorry, not bike. Switch it back to, to Helpling. Maybe you can also tell us how Helpling decides who gets the uh, you know, you know, well balance, right? Um, yeah, sure. First of all, about the flexibility thing. I think that's uh, sort of less of an issue uh, with our platform. Um, we are not offering any on-demand services. So you cannot um, book a Helpling cleaner online and uh, get it within an hour. So that's uh, the first thing that's majorly different, I think, from this. Um, you have to book two days in advance, which means that you sort of can plan ahead your schedule and you know when you have to work or not. Um, with regards to uh, matching jobs, um, we purely look at, uh, as an algorithm, um, availability and distance. Um, so is your customer close to your home and is your new customer potentially close to your previous customer? So you have uh, short travel times. And uh, additionally to that, if you as a customer uh, make a booking on our website, you can actually check reviews for, um, for cleaners that they got by previous customers. Um, and with that, you are able to uh, deselect or select the ones that you wouldn't uh, like to have um, in your offer. So reviews and ratings do matter more in this case? Yeah, uh, it's not selected by the algorithm, so the reviews are not incorporated into that. But customers uh, can look at them and can make a decision upon that, yeah. And I guess it's also more about create, because what you also want to do is create a longer lasting relationship, right? Definitely, yeah. So it's not constantly a new, a new situation. No. And that's also where the flexibility thing comes in again. If you want to, you can be very flexible, um, accept only one of gigs, for example. Uh, but in general, people um, working through a platform um, are more uh, interested in having a long-term relationship with their customers. So for example, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, um, also allowing you to have more of a fixed schedule and not um, waiting for jobs to come in on a daily basis, I would say. Um, so I'd like to turn it to, to Maria, and because um, I, I know you really enjoy also working through uh, through helping. You told I do. me previously, but yeah. you also had this point uh, uh, that you almost brought up, right? That you wanted to bring up earlier in the discussion about uh, uh, the, the social relations, right? And I, I'd just like to give you an opportunity to also ask, ask that question, right? Because it's about asking questions from gig workers, so I know some of you and also some pe people maybe in the audience, gig workers in the audience might have questions, so I want to also then at one point, given the time that I'm keeping track of, also open it up 
first to gig workers that are present, and then maybe later, uh, uh, the final uh, 10 minutes or so, also, or 15 minutes to the, to the wider audience. So, but I know, yeah, so I want to give you that. Yeah, uh, so I'm a social bee. I love contact with colleagues. Uh, so that's my thing with helpling is, um, so you provide a platform uh, between the customer and the gig worker. And is there an opportunity that you can uh, provide a platform between colleagues or take initiative in a monthly meeting that we can meet each other or exchange uh, cleaning tips or uh, <laughs> things like that to make it a, 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 a more feeling of us together and also just getting to know each other and feeling that you've got contact with colleagues which makes I think uh, maybe the job just a little more togetherness but also in uh, I think in the long term you could be more professional because you're getting tips from other colleagues or just this sense of I really love working with Helpling because you've got this sense of us. A very good topic, I would say. I honestly have to say that um, this is not the first time that I'm hearing this, but also um, I haven't really heard this request um, in, um, from many people. So we uh, regularly do uh, panel discussions, for example, with um, cleaners from the platform at our office or um, um, like doing surveys, questionnaires. Um, this topic is actually not coming up that often. The other topic is, that is coming up often is uh, the fact that uh, I think most cleaners and you as well really value the contact with customers. Um, but if it is the case that um, you would also like to see each other as colleagues and exchange tips, etc., then I think that's definitely something uh, to consider uh, for us. Uh, we are all over the Netherlands, so it wouldn't be that easy to have a meeting spot somewhere, but maybe something in like a digital kind of way could could definitely bring you something, like sharing stuff, etc. Build well, that opportunity in the app, for instance, or something like yeah. some. Re related example. to that, I so I signed up for Helpling as well, and um, I was really curious about the process <laughs> of even signing up, because although it's advertised on the website, that the third step is that you get to go to the office and to do some sort of interview there and to meet people and to get your, well, T-shirt, which never happened, by the way. <laughs> like this iconic T-shirt that you see everywhere. That never arrived in my mail, but cool. You'll still get that one, probably. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> um, point is, um, I only had phone interviews with people asking me how would I clean a table, for example, or how would I deal with, I don't know, whatever you need to do within the household. I never got any sort of training except for YouTube videos. Of course, everyone can watch YouTube videos, but uh, I find it strange that there is no checkup as to whether I do watch those or not. Um, and I never got any human contact except for a phone call, well, two phone calls of 15 minutes each, I think. And that was about it. That and my, um, what do you call it? Um, certificate of good conduct that you need to supply to the website. They make sure you're not a criminal, but they don't actually meet you. So what do you? What, what is your? Yeah, I, I, can I just about say that? something about the the cleaning a table? Uh, I remembered as soon as I got into uh, you know working for Helpling, I got this video about just um, uh, cleaning how you clean a house. Uh, you like these videos, these intro videos to yeah, two minutes each tips and like. Did you see it? You did see that. I was, yeah, I was looking at them. Okay. But let's just say that I don't really consider that full training or... Oh, I thought it was or you could, helpful. Or you could, skip, you could skip them as well. I mean, what, what I'm saying is that you as a person who would begin this job, and of course I'm not a professional cleaner. I would like to clarify that. I, I'm just doing this as a tired job, like many people do. Um, but I enter the house of another person, and I'm responsible for well, leaving it in great shape, how does that person know that I'm going to do that? Maybe they rely on the fact that the helping platform will provide good quality cleaners, but they have no idea who's in their house, except for maybe not a criminal. Hopefully not a criminal. Hopefully no. not yeah. a criminal, yeah, yeah exactly. That's one way we, uh, we definitely check. Um, I see your point, first of all, um, in the discussion of not meeting you personally and maybe not getting to know you. Um, as a company, um, we've also been learning in the last couple of years um, how to um, 
make our register registration process uh, easily accessible to all, how to also still get in personal touch with people, and how actually uh, to get to know the people that sign up on your platform. Uh, we've also been trying a lot of things, literally uh, from a phone interview to an interview at the office to um, doing a Skype video to um, letting the um, registration be only online. And um, what we see so far is that um, if you actually invite people to your office, literally from Groningen to Maastricht to everywhere we are in the Netherlands, it forms a, a big barrier for people to actually sign up for the job. So obviously we would like to get to know you and that's what we're trying now with, uh, for example, uh, two interviews on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, but we saw that if you invite people to your office, um, it, it feels like a barrier and the job is meant to uh, be as a flexible job that you can uh, do next to uh, your other occupations, uh, being able to start within a couple of days, being able to make money and receive your customers uh, fast. And um, I think if we would change that whole logic uh, of inviting everyone to our office and making it very personal, that that whole benefit would actually go away. Don't you think that's also a bit insecure for the customer that's getting your services? Because I might as well sign up, I might as well become a user of your platform, and then I might as well give the job to someone else. That's definitely a risk that's there. Um, <coughs> like I said, we check for a police check. Uh, we are trying to make sure that you are the person actually executing the job. But in the end, you are um, a sole entrepreneur, and um, that's um, the risk we take also as a platform. I also, do you want to chime in in this? Because I know uh, um, you wanted to say something, and then I, re I know that there's a couple of people wanting to say, uh, uh, some gig workers also wanted to chime in, looking at the time. Well, so just briefly from you, and then we'll open it up. Since I just heard that you guys are called entrepreneurs with helping, <laughs> so does that mean that you're a ZZ payer and you have to do your own taxes? That's or a very does, good question. Uh, that, wasn't, helping, uh, that wasn't very clear. You said that you can send an invoice to your customer, but in fact, I don't work as a, as a payer through Helpling. I just have to submit my... That was actually a question that it came up from yesterday's talk. Um, I just have to submit a, a paper with all my earnings that I made through the Helpling platform at the end of the year. What happens, though, if my earnings are quite high? How will those be taxed? Because it's quite... Um, good question. Tricky. Also Nobody a shame that you're not uh, so much informed about it. this. But um, in general, um, people that work through the helping platform in the Netherlands are not a uh, sole entrepreneur, actually, so they're not a ZZ payer. Uh, there is a specific regulation in the Netherlands uh, that is called the Regeling Dienstverlening en Huis. And by not getting into too much detail, that allows you as a private individual to work for other private individuals. Uh, meaning that um, exactly at the end of the year, you have to declare your taxes and fill in the earnings that you made through our platform. And that's also why um, we advise a couple of times a year uh, by email and on our platform with our newsletters uh, to check up on, on the earnings you've made also next to your other work uh, to see how much your tax declaration is going to be at the end of the year. So it is possible that I might get hit at the end of the year? And it is possible, yeah. Cool. I, I know no, I mean... <laughs> I, <laughs> Just to say. Uh, so um, I'm now speaking for the rights business. So I always have to switch between rights and careers because it's a different, a different type of uh, thing. Um, even though we're a global company, um, our service is actually very local because we are matching uh, drivers and riders in, in cities. And especially in Europe, the, the discussion is, let's say, easier because we actually move to a fully licensed professional model and drivers, they come to our offices. We have green light hubs where they're getting uh, onboarded, where they can turn to. Again, this is like the business case. I mean, basically we have opening hours where they come and they say, hey, I have a problem with this, I have a problem with that, or can you give me uh, any advice on this or that? So that's for one. Um, we're also starting to organize uh, more round tables um, where we bring together uh, drivers, actually also couriers, we started doing that in the UK now, to um, get feedback how to improve the app again, because we want to, you to use the app. Um, what we also do is we, um, that actually we, we, we know from, for example, from ratings, when we see that someone is struggling with ratings, we um, invite him for um, not mandatory uh, driver um, earning an earning advice session where we can say, look, let's look at what you, uh, why your rating has fallen or why you're actually not getting that many, uh, get many or, uh, orders. 
and that's why we then can look at um, how we can actually improve that and basically explain how the app can, how you can maximize what you get from the app, how you can maximize your time that you want to spend on the app and maximize your earnings. Um, and the very last thing is um, that we are also uh, organizing expos, so that's once a month in the UK, where we basically have a big hall where drivers can come and then we have one stand for airport issues, one stand for uh, maybe uh, train station issues that might be more specific than airport. Uh, so that's something we want to do, again, um, as, as part of our customer outreach, actually. Yeah. Drivers as customers, yeah. right? Okay. Uh, I know you have a tiny a question back, question. and then I want to also ask, uh, after you, I want to uh, just ask, because we have some Uber drivers here uh, in the audience as well, I want to kind of see to what extent you uh, um, feel the need for you know, a good relationship uh, and what that would look like. So I'm already putting it out there. Yeah, your answer uh, triggered me because you told us we uh, created a platform for the drivers so they um, can tell us what they think of our app, but that still sounds like a one direction road. And what about the needs and the interests of your drivers? Are you... But that's, that's happening and that's exactly happening because our interaction with them is the app that they're using and basically if they say, hey, look, this app doesn't allow me to do this or actually my need is that. For example, driver destinations was one. It was, uh, we had a driver said, look, I'm, I want to finish. I don't want to work anymore and uh, I'm accepting one last ride and then it exactly takes me in the opposite direction of where I live. Why is this? Why can I not yeah, control this? But there's this? more than an app. It's also about the sense of belonging. It's also about having a perspective, a basic uh, security in life. So, well, I'm not satisfied at all with this answer, but it's <laughs> to the floor. As happens in families. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <that's, laughs> I, I've been disappointed by my <laughs> uh, answers many times. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to open up the floor from now on and first ask uh, some, before we go to other people, the other constituents or stakeholders, first have a chance for some gig workers in the, in the audience uh, to respond to ha with a question, with a comment, anything. And I want to first start with the, uh, the, the, some Uber drivers uh, that we have here. Maybe can you can just briefly introduce yourself and then... Um, yeah, uh, my name is Chiert. Um, I'm a driver at Uber uh, since January. Um, so um, I'm already 47 and I worked for uh, big companies and multinationals and always had to struggle with uh, management and uh, stakeholders, which I didn't see or uh, know, which made decisions. And I thought, well, let's do it for myself. So uh, since January, I started my own business. I'm a food truck designer. And I started out working for uh, Uber because I like to drive. And to be honest, uh, it's a very uh, flexible uh, job. Uh, you can switch it on whenever you want. I'm very happy. I started working for Uber Black since two months. And I uh, earn more even now. And I just know when to work, when to switch it on, where to be. And I have a lot of contact with colleagues. We do have uh, uh, app uh, groups and uh, we inform each other. Through the Uber app? That yeah. it's no, no, we just have, a, have a, a WhatsApp group to inform each other. Sorry, your uh, question? Oh, no, I was asking uh, uh, through what extent, to what extent uh, uh, do you meet colleagues through Uber, like at the office, for instance? Do you offer? Um, they're always available. Uh, colleagues from Uber, there, uh, very helpful. Yeah, I'm totally happy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a different uh, that's a different perspective, right? From what some of the stuff we put here. Uh, uh, maybe your co your colleague has criticism. <laughs> that's what. That's not my even my question. That was the only question. thing. Only thing which was very interesting for me is insurance and tips. Yeah. And I hope this will be uh, uh, also here in the Netherlands. What do you mean exactly? Like help with it? No, no, no. Uh, the, you oh. know, the thing which is happening is that um, you work and your extra um, efforts you put into it only uh, delivers you uh, better ratings. And ratings are replacing tips in taxi business. Ratings are replacing tips? Yeah. That's a nice call. It, oh, sorry, tax. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to hear that uh, tips can, uh, can be added to the app. So uh, we are uh, doing more than only uh, the better service for good ratings. Thank you. And um, 
other people that want to add, you want to add, then you can pass on the microphone. <laughs> He's coming for you. So, good morning, allemaal. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Najam. I'm the co-founder of uh, Dutch Caps uh, for the last six years. Uh, we are uh, actually uh, helping the drivers in Amsterdam and platform in Rotterdam to uh, give them all in one service. That, uh, that's what, what we are good in. So our uh, first focus is driver, not the, not the consumers. And uh, we are using uh, platforms like uh, Uber and also TCA, uh, TCA, TCA Taxi Centrale and RTC. Um, I had a few things to say. I'm going to take it uh, a really short time. Uh, first of all, I, uh, to be honest with you, uh, the gig workers, that's the term I heard for, uh, today for the first time. And it doesn't felt really good, you know. Uh, it's my own opinion. Um, you know, it feels like, you know, nerds who are, who are working for a platform, but in practical it's not like that. I mean, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity, all, all those platforms, you know, for the, for the market. Uh, what we are worried about, especially uh, if we are talking about the side of the drivers, is the income securities. I mean, that's, that's really the thing what we are uh, focusing on, uh, also our, our own company, Dutch Caps. Um, we are also missing like insurances, so if you can't work or you, ha you got an accident or anything, that we are actually not forcing, but we are uh, giving the drivers also like, you know, um, a focus to that, to, um, to get insured because they are now ZZ payers. And we are seeing also a, a really big shift uh, between, uh, you know, the, the loan dienst uh, workers going to the, to the ZZ pay because that's the future. Um, there are a few last things I, I, I want to say. There is, um, there's no personal touch. Now I'm focusing on Uber platform. Uh, we are missing the personal uh, touch. And uh, that is like also missing a, like team building thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chiet and there are other drivers who are only meeting their colleagues at one spot, you know, next to Schiphol where they are buffering to, uh, to get the client uh, from Schiphol Airport. And um, um, when Uber started for the first time, I, I, I was also there in like 2011 in Amsterdam and they had really good system in the beginning. They were giving like, you know, a recognition to the drivers, a weekly recognition, like a driver of a week, driver of a month. It's a really good thing, you know. There's a saying, they say, um, uh, you know, people kill for money, die for recognition. So that's really an <laughs> a, a important thing. Um, and um, uh, another worry is about the dominating positions of the platform, what we have uh, seen also of, uh, like four or five years ago, uh, everything what is happening in the four years is that, um, you know, the pricing of the market is, it's, is going down. For example, Uber uh, did the price down uh, a few months ago in Uber van, especially. So they have put the pricing of Uber van uh, equal to the, to the car. And that's what we don't like because, you know, of course, you are in the market and you want to make money. And, and, and the customers, they are willing to pay if you are providing the good service. So it's good to, uh, you know, decrease the price, but please, uh, you know, get a good balance that also, you know, the ZZ payers or the people who have to pay the lease and all that can also survive. So they are not for, uh, focusing or working on the minimum uh, wage. So that's what, uh, what we are focusing on now. Um, the last thing, uh, the upgrade Very points shortly, for Uber. Uh, um, uh, take your drivers also serious as you do to the customers. That's the last thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the great like, point by point presentation. So can, uh, can I just ask you short? Yep. Because I know there's a number of other people. And then we'll, yep. We're just going to take it a little bit over yep. time. We can, we can extend this conversation for after the event. And everyone else who wants to join, we can join in. Um, I actually don't know where to start. Maybe first, <laughs> you're right. Um, I think um, even though we, Uber says we have, we have revolutionized the way how people move around, the availability through digital intermediary, it's fair to say that along the way we got uh, something wrong. And that's one side actually to, that's what you're exactly saying, that uh, we maybe have uh, paid less attention to the driver side. Again, both are customers, because you said the customer and the driver for us is both customers. And I think this is where we're now trying to reach out, uh, um, uh, introducing those round tables and to really foster that relationship. Because again, like if you're not happy with the app, then I think that's really part of us growing so fast that we had so many construction sites we were looking at 
And I have to admit that's something that we uh, need to improve on, and that's what we're trying to do uh, in the upcoming months for sure. So later more. Thank you. Thank you for keeping it short too, because I know, Hank, you're dying to say something. All right, can you my, just briefly int introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Kees Witteman. I must be the oldest rider for Deliveroo in the Netherlands. I'm 63 now. I started working uh, in November last year, and I've uh, worked 1,000 hours since then, and I've had about 1,950 orders, and I cycled about 10,000 kilometers. So that's, but I'm not going to ask questions. <laughs> I'm not going to ask questions about of, uh, about the delivery because I know quite a bit of it. But the, like Helpling and uh, Uber, people ask for meetings together. But the problem is, Helpling and Uber don't want to be recognized as an employer, so they cannot do uh, meetings with the with the staff, with the, the people who work for them, because then they're an employer, and that's what they don't want. And uh, but in, the ca in both cases, you uh, decide the, the, the height of the, uh, the fee people get. You decide who you offer their services to. So that makes you an employer already. So why don't recognize yourself as an employer and pay all the, all the necessary taxes? That's my question. <laughs> Just brief answers, and of course, because there's other people that also really dying to have some questions, and then we'll definitely take it into the lunch to, to discuss further. But just briefly, of course, um, respond. Brief answer to this. Um, I think uh, we recognize that this is a very um, complex topic, as also was discussed in the, me in the uh, key presentation this morning. I think it's an issue that all platforms recognize, and we all think that something in this um, situation should change, um, whether this has to do with uh, politics, um, new laws, policy, um, it's, it's important that at some stage we can also do something back for the people working through a platform. Um, unfortunately, at this point of uh, time, this is not possible for us. And I think we have to see what the next couple of years are going to bring um, to see what we can actually do and how we can uh, make our business work within this model. Uh, short answer, and we can extend again. Um, we don't control who's on the, on the platform as long as they basically comply with the minimum requirements that are set out in the member states for the rights business. Um, to become a private hire vehicle driver, you have different requirements in Belgium than in the Netherlands. You have to fulfill those. If you do, you're basically allowed to access the platform. We don't control at any time how many drivers are on the platform. That's actually, if that we would do that, that would come back to uh, license cap. And then our model that there's always a, someone available would not work. Because people basically have different different uh, patterns. Some people say, I only drive at nights because it's less traffic, the demand is high because people come out of the, of the clubs or wherever. And others say, no, I only work uh, during the days to bring people to, to their jobs. So it's really, we, we never know at what point in time how many drivers are on the platform. And we don't want to control it because then the efficiency would be gone. Um, any other uh, uh, gig workers that there have gathered here today uh, wanting to respond to uh, something to add uh, another question? Because then I'm going to slowly open it up. Or, or also, I'm seeing. I just want to make sure that all gig workers that are represented here. Yeah, because I knew you were like Dowdy. Look, so Agnes, <laughs> can you just briefly introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Agnes, and I work for Helping. I do have the. Green T-shirt, and I just come from a gig, so <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a very, very long experience in working independently. Um, I started out as a freelancer in 1995, so this was uh, actually when the World Wide Web was just coming up. There was no platform, nothing at all, and also nobody really worked as a freelancer, or there were hardly any freelancers. I did it because I um, wanted to be independent. Uh, it means that I think I know all the downsides and all the upsides of working independently. In my time, there was no platform. It was very, very hard to find a client. Uh, where could you find your client? You really had to build up your client net. Uh, by the way, I come from... Uh, I was a journalist, copywriter, and then I went into advertisement. Um, I actually tried up to set up a platform like this in 2000 uh, with really, really, really basic technology. 
Um, because nothing was there yet. Um, So I knew how hard it was, but I knew something was going to go there. Um, And then uh, I switched on, or I became a partner in a real uh, advertising network. So I became a partner, normal business, no longer a freelancer. Um, But worked with a lot of freelancers. And now I work for Helpling, which is just really a long, long road. And what happened, my company went broke uh, uh, after the crisis. uh, And um, I started working actually in August. Why this long on introduction? I, I, I don't know, because I think, um, I do know that the discussion of whether you are employed or somebody pays your taxes, uh, like uh, you've just been asked, or whether you are a freelancer and you work alone, I think there will always be this very difficult sort of in-between position which you can never really, really solve. One thing I wanted to ask, and this is what what is my worry? Because in the time when I worked as a freelancer, I was able to set my own rates. And I just heard you say that too. The rates were extremely high in my time when I worked as a freelancer. I could easily ask 100. Of course, it depends on the kind of job, but easily ask 150 per hour. Which means if you work, you. Huh? God, Sorry? <laughs> Gilders and Euros. Gilders and later on also Euros, because this real pricing battle is something that happened only recently, say in the last five years, and before that you could really, really earn a lot of money. So when you were not working, uh, you were sort of quite okay um, most of the time. Uh, you, you just had your sort of buffer and you could just go on. This is no longer the case. And now all the rates, even if you work as a graphic designer, if you work in branding, if you work in whatever, It all goes down because of technology. So my question actually to you, because you just said you were going to allow helping workers to set their own rates. How do you plan to do that? (laughs) That's a good question. I'll let you, and then maybe also in this case, uh, it makes sense also for for the boss to (laughs) also say, the two bosses, right? I think it's a a very difficult topic. I mean, we would very much like to implement this in the, in the next year with Helpling. So as a cleaner, being able to set your own price. Uh, it's a complex issue because you don't want free pricing to go crazy. You don't want people to offer them for a, for a very low rate just to get customers. As the other way around, you don't want people to ask a super high rate and then don't get any demand. Um, so we're currently um, really at the, at the starting process of this. We're doing some testing on, on the customer side. Uh, our customers are actually willing to pay different rates. And uh, we're very at the beginning of this process. So we hope to figure out um, very soon how we can implement uh, a system such as this. Uh, but to be very honest, I don't have a specific view on that yet. Maybe we can get more specific. Yeah. So um, when we say soon, we mean not, not in a year, but uh, this is going live in Germany in November already. So once we have results that it's not completely destroying everything, um, then and you can you can work well with it, and we know what we need to provide in terms of additional information. So you have a good way to set set the price, and you don't like as Michelle said, uh, you, you don't miss out on uh, more money that you could get because like, you know that we only make money if you make money. So, and we have very aligned interests. Um, and this is something that we're working on to be live very, very quickly. So um, that's definitely setting the prices is, is an important factor. The reason why we did not do that in the very beginning was to like, avoid that downward spiral and have more like a competition on, on um, quality than on price. And because it's also technically extremely complex to do that. But uh, like we are now at a time where we can handle it and where we're implementing it. And this is being tested already. And it's going to be live very, very soon in the Netherlands as well. Um, and by next year, it's not September 2018, but it's uh, more like beginning of 2018. So um, in the very early so, so And uh, like I've... I really like to, to hear that this is something that is, is, is appreciated because I, I think it's, it's fundamental. It's, um, just um, regarding the, the conversation from before, regarding the creating this, this, this spirit um, and the sense of community. Um, 
So on the one hand, there is uh, limitation by, by, by law. Yes, we, we cannot um, do that to the extent we would want to. Um, also, in, when you talk about the insurances, we cannot even, like, so we could, from the technical means and uh, the size that we have, we could say, okay, everyone pays 50 cents per, per hour, and then we have kind of an unemployment own system. Um, backed uh, by by um, by an insurance company or something like that, we can't, right? There's 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 just a legal uh, limit for us to to do that. We cannot do that. So um, we also created uh, in, on the event part. We had an event in London where we even had like invited all the families. We had horse riding and etc. Like five people showed up. So it's um, something that is like we, some people like want this. Riding. Other people are really don't they don't care about it. But we're trying to figure out a way of how we can like put people in touch uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a smart way. Um, on the one hand, um, I have also a question to the to the to the people um, um, around. So, what is why are you doing this? So, what is the reason? So, um, what is um, so? Uh, I think it has a lot of opportunities and it uh, fits many people. For um, but I know exactly that it's not for everyone. So. When I hear, um, for example, um, your your point on, on on the work, why are you doing this? Like there are because so many. Because I have to pay rent. At yes, the end but of you the can month. get. Uh, but there are way. There are many other ways to 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 pay rent. You don't need a platform for this. Are you sure, though? Yes, I am. One hundred percent sure. Because my qualification so far did not really fit into the labor market properly, although I do have them. And indeed, you're right that your platform and other platforms have an in, uh, like a, a really easy entry point. You can get hired almost instantly. There is no check. And that's appealing. However, the type of job that you're doing is quite demanding, and the re remuneration for it is super, really low. Super difficult and highly valuable. I, I totally totally see that. But and also, question, yeah, yeah, sure. It's super, di super difficult and highly valuable, but it's really poorly paid. That's it's and the you, thing you that you we have in the market. I, I, I also agree that. You find out how really poorly paid it is, I think, at the end of the year, <laughs> when you have to do your taxes, which is something I don't yet confront because it's not... I, I don't that's know yet how poorly paid it is. That's feedback on the information process I'll, that I'll I let think you know. uh, we, we, we take uh, with us. But So I don't accept the premise of lack of alternatives. So in a world without platforms, like you still have the same challenge that as an art major, it's difficult to live off the art they do. That's the, the romantic view of artists for hundreds I, of I years. I don't believe it's in not the romantic, romantic view but it's No, but it's the, no, let's, let's say it's a cliche view, right? So you graduate in art and then it's very hard to make a living out of that and you need to find something else to make a living. So um, that's, that's very, very, very true, but why is the platform the driver for, for, for the problem? I think maybe for you, in your case, I see a platform as an insufficient solution, right? It's, but it's, uh, it's uh, the best solution at your hands. All right. So is it something you want to respond to? or Because uh, we have one person who still so it's, wants but to But your life doesn't get easier if there's no platform, right? Yeah. It's equally shitty. Yeah. That, doesn't make it, uh, that doesn't make it good per se, but uh, I just want to put it into that context. I think it wouldn't necessarily make it easier or harder, but um, like a full-time contract or even a part-time contract where you kind of have uh, security of your income would certainly make a few things easier because I you... Because... Like, you know, I had, I had a really funny experience. Because Actually, everybody sets it pay. The, the whole of... So Deliveroo right now is like in talks with the Writers Union, which was created by mostly Deliveroo writers, but also uh, people from Fudora and other companies because they're trying to make sure that writers in general get like either employment contract or security or rights in general. And the Deliveroo managers, from what I heard, who met with the unions, unions where I don't know where they are, um, were told that why don't you try to get another job? So your employer, in my case employer, tells you, you know, if you really want to make a living, maybe you should go somewhere else. So we, <laughs> you should no, get another... It's, it's ridiculous. But you're also telling me the same thing. Why do I choose your platform? Because you're advertising yourself as... Yes. 
as an opportunity for me. No, but I, apparently we're not, right? So I cannot convince someone for whom it doesn't make sense. But, uh, no, but like convince I have yourself to that you're not an opportunity. So for you, apparently not. But for many people, there we are. And I think that's the point of it, uh, that we, like, uh, there, A, we are not forcing anyone, and, like, if there's... I don't believe that there's complete lack of alternatives. You're driving, indeed, you're driving, like, rate really low, so you're not forcing me. But if I really do have to make a living, I'm confronted with the possible... Uh, with really, like, yeah... Uh, I'm going to step in from the uh, parents. Uh, of this family, because uh, this is not going to be resolved right now. Uh, no, some people are starving, but <laughs> there's one person who I uh, who he's been trying to get this uh, question in or comment in. I want to give him that opportunity because he came from uh, from the UK. Um, uh, yeah, can you please introduce yourself and then uh, your question, and hopefully from there on we can all start moving towards there and have some food because <laughs> it's better arguing on a on a on, you know, on a filled stomach than an empty stomach, right? Thanks. Uh, my name is Jason Moyer Lee. I'm General Secretary of the IWGB Trade Union. Uh, in the UK, we represent uh, workers in the so called gig economy, including Uber drivers, delivery riders, couriers, etc. Uh, and we've brought a number of legal cases against these companies over workers' rights, including uh, we represent the drivers in the Uber case. Uh, I'm afraid my members are in the unhappy family camp. Um, I have one comment and two questions. I'll try to be as quickly as I can. Um, the, we've heard a lot of claims from the Uber presentation, uh, which are a lot of the standard kind of Uber PR spin. Uh, we've heard that the driver is the customer of Uber. Um, we've heard uh, that Uber doesn't have any control over how the drivers do their work. We've heard that Uber is just the middleman matching supply and demand. And incredibly, we've heard that they don't even know how much supply and how much demand there is. And we've heard uh, the drivers referred to as independent workers, which I assume means kind of micro-entrepreneurs, independent contractors in business on their own account. Uh, now, luckily in the UK context, um, we've had the privilege of the British legal system taking a look at all these claims. Uh, and in the workers' rights case, which was a case brought by Uber drivers claiming they were in the third category, which is a limb B worker, which is a type of self-employed person who carries out their work as part of someone else's business and for that reason is entitled to most of the employment rights in the UK. And I just want to quote briefly from the judgment about this issue. From paragraph 87, it says, in the first place, we have been struck by the remarkable lengths to which Uber has gone in order to compel agreement with its, perhaps we should say its lawyers, description of itself and with its analysis of the legal relationships between the two companies, the drivers and the passengers. Any organization, A, running an enterprise at the heart of which is the function of carrying people in motor cars from where they are to where they want to be, and B, operating in part through a company discharging the regulated responsibilities of a private hire vehicle operator, but C, requiring drivers and passengers to agree as a matter of contract that it does not provide transportation services through UBV or ULL, and D, resorting in its documentation to fictions, twisted language, and even brand new terminology merits, we think, a degree of skepticism. And then from paragraph 90, just very briefly, fourth, it seems to us that the respondent's general case and the written terms on which they rely do not correspond with the practical reality. The notion that Uber in London is a mosaic of 30,000 small businesses linked by a common, quote, platform, end quote, is to our minds faintly ridiculous. That's from a judge in London. Um, so I would make the case uh, that it is not just misleading for Uber to continue to make these claims, at least in the UK context, it is patently untruthful. Um, and my questions, two brief questions, um, one is I'm always interested to hear gig economy employers talk about trying out to come up with new innovative ways of providing pensions and other employment rights and whatnot. Now, the current law in the UK is that Uber drivers are workers, which means that as a matter of law, they're entitled to pension enrollment and pension contributions from Uber, minimum wage, and holidays, among other rights. So my first question is, rather than appealing the judgment, why not, and trying to come up with innovative ways of offering similar things, why not accept the judgment um, and give these drivers the rights they're legally entitled to? The second question uh, is I was very surprised to hear that Uber has no control over the supply of drivers um, because, in fact, I think you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that as long as they satisfy the private hire vehicle regulations in a given country, they're allowed to drive for Uber. Uh, now, I had an email just two days ago uh, about a member of mine uh, who works for Uber who was fired. Um, so my question to you is, 
if I can show you that he uh, satisfies the private hire vehicle regulations, will you give him his job back? Lorraine, a brief uh, uh, moment to respond. I know it's impossible for you to briefly respond, but then we have to really, really take it outside. Well, not in that sense. <laughs> no, not, wow, okay, Freudian. All right, I'm gonna stop speaking. Thanks, thanks for, for the questions. First of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I will not go into the legal text. Uh, all I know is that we're appealing the case, as you mentioned, and um, we believe that um, Basically, the judgment has been based on, on wrong facts. That's why we're appealing. So we're using the British legal system to uh, appeal that and to correct that. Um, secondly, um, that's exactly what I tried to, maybe it was a bit fast, but that's why we're trying to work on options that are more tailored in order to address the social safety net concerns that, have, uh, that uh, independent workers have. Um, frankly speaking, um, the, the model that we operate for example, if, that's hypothetical, if Uber drivers would be employed, we would not have that many drivers on the platform, which means we would have to limit uh, the absolute amount. We would have to limit uh, the times where there's no, no demand. And um, then basically the whole system comes to a stop because it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. With, with this open system, everyone can log on and log off whenever he wants. And he can decide to take a take uh, to 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 answer a request, or he does not, and that's up uh, fully uh, to his discretion. He has the he has the absolute power to either access the Uber app, either work on helpling, either work uh, I don't know in in a bar, or go for a full time job if if he has one. So there's no limitation, there's no exclusivity. We actually have drivers that have. Um, that they have like two or three smartphones and that might actually jump between apps. Because again, like with Uber, my, my customer is only in 10 minutes, but with this one, it's in, in three. So I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll pick and choose. Many more questions, many unresolved uh, uh, issues, but really we have to wrap up because Can we're I already running 15 minutes late. One, uh, one last. If it's really quick. It's uh, really quick. Really yeah. quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were just talking about um, uh, uh, helping uh, people setting their own rates. In my opinion, that's very, very scary and dangerous because you have the ones who work for full time and the side jobs and even people for who it's just a hobby or something like that. And there's always someone who wants to go work for one euro less. And find a way to set a floor. That's a thing that... The it's uh, dangerous as long as there's no balance between the bargaining power of helping yep. Uber and the workers. So the first step is for all the workers that come together, tell the whole story, uh, look for publicity. You can wait for the traditional unions, but that's going to be a long wait. So you have to um, find each other and uh, start organizing and tell the whole story and make sure your collective powering goes up. That's what I wanted to say, because um, it's more than, uh, well, that's, that's the, the real problem, I think. All right, thank you. Hey, um, we have to close here, but I'm sure we're going to continue over there. I first want to take the, uh, this opportunity to uh, thank all the gig workers who, who took time to be here and to uh, participate. <laughs> so please help me thank them. But also, of course, I'd like to thank, uh, thank the people who are actually willing to be here and, and, uh, and answer this, some of these questions and engage. So I also want uh, an applause for them. And then we can go have a lunch. Thank you. Thank you.